Oi! Hi, uh, Vikram Mansharmani. I'm a lecturer at Harvard University, the author of Boom Bustology, Spotting Financial Bubbles Before They Burst, and also the founder of Kalan Capital. At Harvard University, I teach a class called Humanity and Its Challenges, Systems Thinking Approaches to the World's Toughest Problems. And I previously taught a class at Yale University called Financial Booms and Busts. Kalan Capital is an investment advisory firm where I help manage uh, some capital on behalf of some wealthy families in the Midwestern part of the United States. One of the topics that I articulate in this next edition of Boom Bustology is that I believe passive investing has gotten ahead of itself uh, and is continuing to grow at unsustainable levels, creating a dynamic which I believe is becoming increasingly dangerous. And so what do I mean by that? The fundamental sort of premise upon which passive investing is based is that prices are right. So don't bother worrying about prices. You just deploy capital, the prices are accurate, the markets are efficient, and therefore, minimize your fees, don't waste dollars, time, or effort on actual research or fundamental analysis. It's a waste of time. Prices are right. That logic has led many people into this passive investing mantra, uh, if you will, that says, fine, minimize fees, take the market. And so the idea is that you are a price taker as an investor if you're passively investing. The problem is, as this becomes a larger and larger percentage of the market, what we're finding is that these price takers have become price makers. And flows now matter almost as much, if not more than, uh, the fundamental valuation that might be applicable to a particular company. And so what we're starting to see is when there are inflows, we're seeing good and bad companies rise. And when there are outflows, we're seeing good and bad companies fall. And so the distinguishing qualities of a company are becoming less relevant. Why does this matter? This matters because what used to be a sort of individual company story uh, investing market is becoming less and less so because prices and the signaling mechanism that prices provide are becoming less relevant. And so this actually is the basis upon which capitalism is based, right? I mean, capitalism believes that prices help direct capital. And so therefore, if prices lose their validity, this creates a really dangerous dynamic in terms of the allocation of capital. And that fundamentally creates unsustainable conditions, which is the topic of boom bustology. One of the dynamics that's really disturbing is the number of active investors has been plunging. We've seen flows leave the active investment community and go towards the passive investment community. This is part of the problem. And I think the reason why it hasn't gotten enough attention is because passive investing still appears to be half or maybe even less than half or slightly more than half of all the invested dollars. So, okay, it's still not running the show, so to say. I think that analysis is flawed because what we have is a large community of the active investors that are actually closet indexers. And so the de facto passive investing is much larger than everyone believes because of this closet indexing that's taking place under active managers. Um, and so I think that we're actually closer to a problematic tipping point than perhaps some of the data might suggest. To take an extreme example, imagine if everyone was investing passively. There would be no fundamental research done. An inflow would take every stock up, an outflow would take every stock in the index down. We would have no distinguishing qualities, no distinguishing characteristics for a company that's doing well or poorly. Imagine what that would mean for the raising of capital, the most powerful companies in this domain would be those who determine the components of an index, which sort of confuses the whole investing business, so to say. What we would see is more tightly correlated performance among index components. So all index components would go up, all index components would go down on days. And so if we imagine a world where the S&P 500, every security went up 
X percent in a day that we had inflows and every security in the S&P 500 went down on certain days, then in fact we would be at a place where I think you would not see any distinguishing qualities or in any distinguishing performance or differentiation among the securities. The idea of passive investing resulting in higher correlations both dampens volatility and also increases volatility. And it sounds contradictory, but in the short run on a day-to-day -day basis, what you would see is a slowly virtuous cycle playing. Inflows, stocks creep up, inflows, stocks creep up, and et cetera. And then, as we saw here in the middle of May, you'd see some vicious downdrafts where virtually all securities go down, and then vicious bounce backs or virtuous bounce backs where virtually all securities go down. And so you're seeing sort of a dampening as well as uh, a sort of a, an increasing of volatility simultaneously. And so uh, it creates these cross currents that are very difficult to navigate. So this phenomenon of passive investing and sort of this rise of index-based uh, allocation of capital does create the schizophrenia that we're seeing in markets. Uh, and so you'd see this sort of almost bipolar nature to markets. Uh, I think that's, that's a logical ramification. And by the way, I think that gets worse, not better over time as passive continues to grow. You know, as for when the tipping point happens where passive eventually gets to the point where literally markets fail to allocate capital correctly, I can't say when that will happen with precision. But unfortunately, I think that the passive share is going to continue to rise uh, for some period of time. Spotting a financial bubble is actually quite difficult, right? It's a probabilistic exercise, it's ambiguous, there's conflicting signals and what have you. Uh, so one of the indicators that I've really loved looking at that helps spot financial bubbles uh, and has worked in the past has been the world's tallest skyscrapers. And if you go back in time, uh, this actually works, which is the stunning part of it. Uh, and so what we have is in 1929, we had three buildings competing for the world's tallest tower here in New York City. You had uh, the Chrysler Building and, and 40 Wall Street competing, only to be outdone by the Empire State Building, followed by the Great Depression. Uh, in 73 and 74, we had the Sears Tower and the World Trade Centers and a decade of stagflation. In 1997, we had the Petronas Towers take the title of the world's tallest tower in Malaysia, ground zero of the Asian financial crisis, before the financial crisis really took off. And then in 1999, uh, actually it was the, the start of construction, there were some delays, but Taipei 101 uh, eventually became the world's tallest tower. And that was fueled on the back of optimism and confidence uh, in Taipei, or really the home of the, the technology boom, at least in a hardware and semiconductor sense, the foundries and what have you. In 2007, the world's tallest tower title moved to Dubai. Uh, where the Burj Dubai at the time, it's since been relabeled, the Burj Khalifa, took the title on July, uh, in July of 2007, within weeks of global equity markets peaking, the Guinness Book of World Records called it the world's tallest freestanding structure. So that's really interesting. This tends to work. And so when I've looked at why it works, it works for really three main reasons. Number one, skyscrapers, the world's tallest skyscrapers, generally are built with borrowed money. So it's an easy money indicator. Uh, number two, they're usually built by developers seeking to attract tenants. So it's a build it and hopefully the tenants will come. So it's a naturally, uh, it's a, it's a naturally speculative in, uh, endeavor. Um, and lastly, these things are embodiments of hubris, right? I mean, competing to get the world's tallest tower status, that is absolutely overconfidence being manifested in this irrational way. So that's why the indicator has worked. Now, more interestingly, I would imagine, would be what does this indicator say now? And what does it say about the future? And so one thing we noticed was after 2007, the world's tallest towers under construction, likely to take the title, had been in China. So 2011, 12, 13. There's a great story. Sky City was a, was a building that the Chinese were going to erect within 90 days at a cost of under a billion dollars. Uh, that would take the title away from the Burj Dubai. Uh, interestingly enough, when they announced that, I said, that's great, 90 days, uh, you know, one-fifth the cost of the Burj Dubai. Uh, that's great. I'm not going in it. I'm going to sort of make sure I stay a good couple blocks away until a good typhoon comes by. They ultimately didn't build it. Um, 
capital didn't uh, materialize, the, the, et cetera. And today it's being used as a fish farm. Uh, literally, the foundation of Sky City is being used as a farm for fish. Uh, it's filled with water, et cetera, et cetera. So these things actually do show hubris even before they're built. Uh, so right now, what we have on the books are three towers competing to be the world's tallest towers. Right now in Saudi Arabia, the Jeddah Tower is scheduled to be the world's tallest tower. And then we also have the Dubai Creek Tower trying to outdo that because the, the folks in the UAE want to keep the title of the world's tallest. Uh, and so, by the way, this is just fascinating to me as a sociological phenomenon because it is hubris, easy money, and uh, speculative instincts all wrapped into one. And so this is a fun multi-lens indicator that sort of captures those spirits to tell us when we're sort of getting uh, a little bubbly, if you will. Now, why this is even more concerning to me is that coming out of the Middle East at this time to have hubris and overconfidence and easy money there uh, lines up with other equally disturbing developments. So right now, for instance, Saudi Arabia has the world's third largest defense budget. They have a budget, that they spend more on military and defense matters than Russia does. And one has to ask the question as to why. Now, that is a really concerning development to have someone spending a lot of money on military and defense at the same time as exhibiting signs of overconfidence and hubris. It leads me to con be concerned about Middle East stability. I think the risks, of rise the risks are rising for a potential conflict. Um, and so I worry about the Middle East. The ramifications of forthcoming instability in the Middle East are really uh, quite hard to disentangle, right? I mean, you can imagine in a situation if there were conflict and capital started to leave the region, that Saudi Arabia would decide to pump as much as possible to capture whatever cap capital they could. You could also imagine a scenario where the spigots get turned off and there's an oil price shock where prices go through the roof. Sadly, I don't have a great uh, insight into which of those two scenarios is likely. What I can say with great confidence is Middle East instability will continue to provide volatility to the oil markets. I think that is something we can say for sure. Another one of my favorite multi-lens indicators for spotting bubbly conditions has been the common stock price of Sotheby's. Now, uh, this is a really interesting stock chart. Uh, if you pull it back to when the company went public in 1988 or 89, uh, the stock immediately goes vertical and then comes back down. It peaked, I believe it was October of 1989. And when you go back and look at the news stories of art markets at that point in time, what we found were Japanese buyers paying world record prices for art. Sotheby's stock reflected that. The stock came off in October of 89, the Nikkei peaked in December of 89, and it hasn't gone back since. Sotheby's stock later in 1999 peaks and ends up, as not surprisingly, having uh, been driven to that elevation by buyers from the technology, media, and telecom sectors buying art at world record prices. And sure enough, the stock peaks in 1999, the internet bubble or the, the NASDAQ bubble, if you will, peaked in 2000. So it sort of was a nice leading indicator. Again, Sotheby's stock price in 2007 hits an all new high driven on the back of world record art prices being uh, set by Russian oligarchs, private equity billionaires, and other beneficiaries of easy money. And so sure enough, we had a credit bubble that burst shortly thereafter. Now, what's interesting is the stock has sort of bounced around up and down a lot recently between 2013, where it was Chinese buyers paying world record art prices, uh, into Middle Eastern buyers in 15, 17 uh, paying world record art prices, and recently Sotheby's stock price has come off. Now, if it were to continue falling, I would be really concerned here because what it's saying is that the confidence of art buyers is waning. But let me just highlight most recently the world's most expensive paintings. $400 million plus painting was purchased by Middle Eastern buyers. Now what's interesting is when the skyscraper indicator points to Middle East instability forthcoming or unsustainable conditions, and now art markets are saying the same thing, and then we line it up with defense budgets, you are starting to get some things pointing in a direction that make me triangulate forthcoming instability. Now, why do art markets work? And why do world record art prices telegraph financial bubbles uh, or telegraph forthcoming uh, you know, plunges, if you will? I think they work for one reason. 
the person who buys art for $100 million plus presumably is an economic or corporate leader in their society. Uh, they've got a lot more, presumably, than the $100 million they're paying for this painting. And so when they see dark clouds on the horizon of their professional lives as a corporate or economic leader in their society, then they are less likely to hit the gas on their bidding behavior in their personal life. And so when we see people take, the take their foot off the gas in terms of bidding uh, in their personal life, what, it, what I'm trying to interpolate back is what does that say about their confidence in their professional life? And therefore, when the stock price comes off, it's because the world record art prices are not being set anymore. Confidence is waning on the margin uh, in terms of art markets. And that usually indicates ahead of time that confidence is waning on the part of economic and corporate leaders. I believe technology is proving far more disruptive than globalization has been to labor markets around the world. And I'll give you an example. So I've worked with a couple of large multinational companies and one of them uh, was sharing with me about their factories in the United States. And so in the 1980s, they had 14 factories producing a particular product. Uh, today, there's six factories producing more than they originally produced in those 14 factories. Further, the employment per factory has fallen by about 65%. So they're using 35% of the people in each factory, and they've gotten rid of more than half of their factories. This is all within the United States. This is the impact of technology. Globalization had nothing to do with the loss of jobs in this particular manufacturing company. And so I think more of that has been happening than people are sort of aware of and cognizant of. This is not to say that globalization has not had an impact. It has. But the rise of this sort of populism and nationalism, wanting to blame others for the impacts on job losses and labor markets, I think is partially unwarranted. And my hope is, is that this is a passing phase, that five, 10 years from now, we'll say, oh, we went through that bout of populism and nationalism and protectionism and deglobalization, and we've since reversed it because we realized that actually the, uh, the sort of disruptive beast in the room was not globalization. Sure, it was contributing, but the really disruptive beast in the room was technology. And so I think that's a really important consideration to think about when thinking about some of these big political economic trends that are facing us. Emerging markets investors have historically felt that India was going to be the next big thing. Uh, even corporate investors in India believe it's the next big thing. In fact, Tim Cook uh, of Apple suggested that India would be the next China. Uh, I just think this is bluntly false. It's not true. I don't see how the math works. There's a couple of different reasons why I believe that to be the case. So India, I believe, has missed its opportunity to develop a large middle class by industrializing. I think they're 50 years too late. China, really starting in the 70s into the early 80s, uh, started to industrialize. And what they did was they took the farmers to the factories, threw some capital at them, some equipment, and had massive productivity increases and produced goods for the world. Uh, and the world bought them because they were built cheaper and labor was a large component of the cost of goods to produce them. And as such, cheap labor and lots of it was a real advantage. Roll the clock forward to today. China's built a middle class, they're starting to consume, their economy is transitioning from an investment-led economy towards a consumption-led economy. India and Prime Minister Modi have looked at China with you know, adoring eyes and suggested, we too can do that. And the Indians launched the Make in India campaign, and that campaign was designed really to create a lot of jobs by bringing global manufacturing companies to India. And so Make in India was supposed to produce 100 million jobs. And so India has, in fact, obtained large manufacturing companies. They have come to India. The problem is India is not creating the jobs. And that is ultimately what is needed to develop a middle class. And so India, for instance, is adding 1 million people per month to the labor pool. And that means you need to have 1 million jobs created per month to not go backwards, at least in terms of unemployment. So I think India is miserably failing in terms of job creation. That's number one. Number two, 
automation is taking away the future potential of an industrialized strategy to develop a middle class. I don't think that's, a, that's not a viable option anymore. Technology and the future has come too quickly for India. Many people tell you that India has a demographic dividend coming because of its large, young population. Uh, I would argue that's not the case. Yes, they do have a large, young population, but it's my suggestion because this development strategy has shifted away from industrialization, uh, that you can't really build a large middle class based on factory jobs, that India's demographic dividend, quote unquote, is in fact turning into a demographic noose. This is actually gonna be a huge burden. Having lots of young people, that means you need to produce lots of jobs. And that's not something that's easy to do today. And so I think India is a, uh, a country that's got a real challenge ahead of it. You know, if Prime Minister Modi were to ask me, Vikram, what should we do? Uh, I would say two things. Number one, you've got to educate, 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 upskill your population because there's no hope without that. Uh, and number two, you got to actually contain the population growth. The fertility rate has been falling, but just mere medical advances will mean that population is going to continue to grow for the indefinite future. And that is a problem for a country like India. I wouldn't even suggest that China and India are competing. Uh, they, they were running different races, right? I mean, China ran a race starting in the 70s while India was asleep at the switch. Uh, and then they won the race, but India's starting to run. And so it's like, okay, what's going on? You need to actually develop a strategy for bringing large numbers of people into a middle class so they consume goods and services. I'll give you a couple examples. Number one, the average Indian, I think, earns a salary of around $2,000, $2,300 a year, something in that range. Uh, an iPhone is not gonna be a large selling item in India if it represents almost half of an annual salary of an individual. Like you're not gonna sell billions of iPhones in India. It's not gonna happen. So fine, that's a high price item. What about something like Starbucks? So Starbucks has 3,500 or something like that number of stores in China, and they're adding a new store every 14 hours, 14 to 15 hours, a new Starbucks store. There's huge demand because there's a middle class there. India had something like 130 to 150 Starbucks stores, and they were adding them at the rate of one a week. India doesn't have the consumption power that China does. And so I think there's a real challenge that the Indian government has here. Not to mention that the promise made to the Indian youth is that your future is gonna be bright. So I think there's the possibility of unrest rising within India as well, as these promises are left unfulfilled. Now that's a longer term development, but as we can already see with the divisive uh, election that's underway, the country is not as unified as some had believed. Uh, and so, you know, is it possible that nationalism starts rearing its ugly head in an even larger way in India? Yeah, I think so. We saw a glimpse of that earlier this year with the India-Pakistan uh, interchanges, military interchanges. And so, you know, I think nationalism might be the way you hold India together, but ultimately, without jobs, it's a tinderbox. Fundamentally, what I'm getting at is that technology is changing the development strategy and technology is fundamentally changing the globalized nature of manufacturing. And so the way I look at it is I break down the cost of a good. What percentage of producing a good was labor? What percentage of delivering the good was transportation or what have you? And I think what we're finding is that technology is increasingly displacing labor in the cost of goods. What that means is that the geography of manufacturing fundamentally needs to shift. And so putting large manufacturing facilities in destinations with large pools of cheap labor is no longer necessary. In fact, you might, you might find that freight and transportation costs are more important than labor, in which case you might want to actually put your factories close to your ultimate demand. So you'd want to put them right next to the actual uh, consumers of your goods that you're producing. So the whole geography of manufacturing shifts away from these large population, low-income societies towards the large population, large budget consumer societies. Um, and so could the United States have a manufacturing renaissance? Yeah. Could North America, could Mexico benefit because of these shifting supply chains? Definitely. 
You could also think about the implications that that shifting geography of manufacturing would have on an industry such as shipping. So right now, container ships move finished goods from places with large populations of cheap labor to the consumer societies in the developed world. Well, it turns out that may not be as important as, for instance, something like dry bulk, which you'd be moving the dry or sort of the raw ingredients that go into manufactured goods to those destinations, but yet you wouldn't have to bring finished goods. So that has implications for container shipping versus dry bulk shipping. Uh, and there's huge implications for the movement of manufacturing around the world. So ultimately, navigating uncertainty and financial markets such as those we face today, which are highly uncertain, I think requires a fundamentally different mindset. It requires you to stop worrying about generating dots uh, and start worrying about connecting them. Stop worrying about developing really deep, deep, deep information and instead start worrying about connecting the information and developing breadth of insight. Macro becomes more important. And I think what you ultimately have to do is take a step back and zoom out to see the big picture. It's becoming increasingly relevant. And I think in times of heightened uncertainty, it's really that approach which can give you some possibility of navigating successfully.